Our third speaker is, uh, the, the topic of our third presentation is synchronization and timing in ST2110. Our speaker is Paul Briscoe, who is a consultant with Everts Microsystems in Canada. Paul began his industry career in 1980 at CBC Television and has worked for Leach Technology and Everts Microsystems. Today he provides technology and standards consultation to the rapidly evolving media industry. He is a Canadian regional governor, past chair of the Toronto section, and a fellow of the society, as well as a member of IEEE and an active participant in many SMPTE and other standards committees. An established industry thought leader, he has delivered many technical papers to, uh, to audiences including SMPTE, IEEE, VSF, AES, IRT, NAB, and PBS. Please welcome Paul Briscoe. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. You certainly exaggerated that all the heck. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and uh, thanks to John and to the uh, program committee for inviting me to talk about one of my favorite topics. And the reason it's one of my favorite topics is, well, oh, I'm looking at Mr. Symes. A little over 10 years ago, we started a task force. I see Mr. Symes and I saw Dr. Hoffman here earlier. EBU and SIPTI started a little task force to look at the next generation of synchronization. And we spent uh, several years trying to wrestle through what it should be. And really, the only thing we knew is it needed to do what we do today. We needed to work on an IP network. And it turned out we landed on PTP as a core infrastructure without knowing that SIPTI 2110 would actually be needing such a thing. So we had a lucky guess and we won. You don't always win when you throw the dice, but we did. So this is one of my favorite topics. I've been working on this uh, with many people in this room for a while. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about how it works, just to bring you up to speed on PTP, and then how it fits with 2110, because it really is a beautiful fit. There we go. So what do we need to do in media synchronization? Well, this is your standard plant reference kind of scenario, right? You want to lock a whole bunch of what we'll call slave devices, equipment that plug into Genlock. You want to lock them to a master generator that's somewhere central. And what this means then is that they're all synchronous. They all are running at the same frequency, totally synchronously, no slip, no slide, lock tight, and in a known phase relationship with respect to the master. Right? We do this, of course, if you've ever timed a studio, you've got to dial everything into the switcher to make sure everything's inside the auto timer and so on. So locked and timed is what we have to do. Now, the reference signals we use are legacy signals. They're old. They're streaming analog signals. Noisy, dirty analog signals, and even in the SDI era, these things have lasted because they're robust as heck and they work really, really well. Things like black first tri-level and DARS. But in IP, I think it was felt we needed a better solution. If you're going to move to a technology where one hose can connect a piece of equipment, both input and output, multiple streams and all of this, two hoses for redundancy and stuff, do you want to have a coax bringing you black first? Do you want to have a second coax bringing you DARS? Do you want to have a third coax bringing you time coded? It, it's, it's obtuse. So we had to look at something new and different. And so IP systems need a solution that, for example, runs on the network with or without the essence. We're going to have a network connected already. We may as well push this stuff down the network. We need to do everything we do today, right? 99% of everybody's going to keep doing tomorrow what they did today as that 1% begins to increment at 2110 and then 2% and 5% and 10%. And eventually, it'll be a mass evolution, but we have to get there slowly. And we have to support future unknown formats. Now, this is really cool. This is a tough one, in fact. How do you support a format you don't know about? 764 frames per second, 3,168 pixels wide and this tall. Like, we can invent anything. We need a synchronization mechanism that will accommodate it. So it's a tough order. So what we're talking about is virtualizing these references over IP networks. And at the core of our synchronization needs, it's really all about time, right? The passage of time is frequency, and time itself is an absolute point in a time scale. And in the digital domain, we do this by counting one, two, three, four, five at a certain frequency, right? That's how we represent time digitally. In fact, it's not that different from how a clock works. Pendulum goes back and forth, and things go tick, 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 and gears turn around. It's counting as well, and this is what we do. But IP networks don't know anything about this, right? They don't know about frequency. Packets go back and forth. So we can't move frequency around, but we can move counter values. And using this technology, we can now consider how we synchronize across a network. So we use these counters, and these counters are called in the nomenclature of network timekeeping, they're called clocks. Now, 
engineers think, oh, clocks, it's a clock pulse from an oscillator, it's an edge that triggers something. No, 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 we're talking about counters. These are clocks, and we're going to use this terminology repeatedly to try and drive it home a little bit. So if we can establish a high-precision clock of some kind, a counter of some kind, and transfer it across the network to a whole bunch of slave clocks, the frequency and the phase can be conveyed, and I'll show you how. IP networks, however, are not very good at this. Packets get out of order, packets get out of loss, things get in the way of everything else. These clock values can be altered by the time it takes for delivery, so we need something that accommodates that. So we discovered this thing called IEEE 1588 Precision Time Protocol. It's a technology from the IEEE that delivers precision time to slave devices, a vast number of slave devices across an IP network. It can also run on layer two. It provides what we're used to, provision for a master, and many, many slave devices. So fundamentally, it sounds about right. You can put uh, redundancy into the master. You can have two, three, four more masters. They have a management method to keep the best one on at all times. You can put redundancy into the distribution, something we can't do readily with Genlock. You can reference it to GPS to lock frequency and time, and right now that is the highest level frequency and time accuracy you can get on the planet domestically. And the stuff will work with network traffic. This is a brilliant and necessary piece of this as well, because if we're going to put it over the media network, we need to make sure it's not perturbed by the traffic. And in fact, network switches can help this stuff work even better. So on the network, PTP transmits these little tiny packets, and we can use both Unicast or multicast or a mix of these technologies to move this stuff around the network. In the multicast domain, it works on reserved addresses, so it's fairly well protected from other traffic in the network. Uh, the switches, in fact, can participate, as I mentioned, to provide services to improve the performance, and there's several ways that can happen. Uh, there's a mode or type of switch called a boundary clock, which essentially receives a master on one port and replicates that master's uh, behavior on every other port. So it provides a private master to every device plugged in to that switch except one port on which it receives its master. There's another type of switch called a transparent clock. This one uses a more simple process. In the process of passing a timestamp through, it knows the residency time of that packet in the switch, so it can adjust the timestamp through an offset field to allow the receiver to know, oh, well, the time from the master was this, and oh, by the way, it waited this long at the traffic lights in the switch. Add them together, now you know the real delay. But in fact, software-defined networking and quality of service management can also guarantee path latency. So PTP can work in a number of ways on an IP network. What does it do? Well, strictly the language is it transfers a precision time count or clock to many slave devices over a non-deterministic network like IP through periodic messages. So it transfers frequency through a running time count. And this is kind of interesting. It's a big counter that's clocked virtually at one gigahertz. So when I say virtually at one gigahertz, the counter's behavior is as though it's counting nanoseconds. Doesn't mean you have to run the physical counter at a nanosecond. You could run that counter instead of at a gigahertz, run it at 100 megahertz, and every tick of the clock add 10, not one. It still looks like a one gigahertz counter. Implementation is totally different from the actual counter itself. And then it transfers phase via the same running time, right? And at some point, that counter's value was zero. And with respect to that point in time, this counter is carrying phase information because we have an anchor in the past that tells you where you've been. Therefore, you know how far you've come. And it's a neat counter. The base part of the counter spans about 136 years at a granularity of a nanosecond. That's in 32 bits of second counting. You'll see in a second, it's actually a 48-bit seconds counter. So if we add four more bits to this and go to uh, 36 bits, you're out to two millennia. So there are bits to go further, but I don't think we even need to think about those. If we're doing this in 136 years, we really got it right, and I'm all wrong about the future of television. So when you lock this to something external like GNSS, GPS, you can now have multiple slave devices that are unaware of each other locked to GPS who can generate the same PTP times and the same PTP frequencies by virtue of this link coming down from the sky. I love this little diagram. Uh, this is the counter in PTP, sort of simplified. It's two pieces. I've shown 32 bits of the second counter. It takes you out about 136 years by counting seconds. And a nanosecond counter. The way this thing works then is the nanosecond counter ticks along at a virtual one gigahertz. And when it counts up to a billion minus one, it ticks the second counter and resets to zero. So every billion minus one, well, every billion nanoseconds, we increment a second and zero or nanoseconds. Spread out across the top here are some of the things we're interested in and how they fit the behavior of this counter. So have a look. Composite video on the right, SDI video and AES audio. 
They all require precisions down in the submicrosecond to nanosecond granularity, but they're periodic. So when you get up to the frame time, they're actually repetitive. A video frame is a repetitive thing. It ends and starts again. And what do we do then? We increment time code. Time code, of course, increments at frame rate. It counts us out to one day. What happens at the one day point? We increment the calendar. And then we go back and count out another day. The other interesting thing about this magic counter is this line here. And I, I kind of like this little thing. Can anybody take a wild guess? Just yell out what you think that line is. And if I've told you before, don't say, because that spoils it. That's your human existence on a PTP time counter. We can all sort of see around frame accuracy, but not much more granular than that. And we may live to be in our 90s or around 100 years. So your entire human existence can be expressed in the behavior of this counter. That's kind of how powerful this technology is. Just a neat way to look at what this thing can do. So there are some issues, though. Networks are non-deterministic, right? You can't guarantee the arrival time of a message. You don't know the latency through the network. It may change. So PTP, instead of just sending out the time, also allows the slaves to request a message from the master telling it how, what, well, the way it works without going deep is the slave says, tell me what time you received this message. And the slave knows what time it sends that, and the master sends back a message that says, oh, I received it this time. The slave now has a sense of the delay in the path. It can look at that round trip time and establish how much additional time that time message, the original time message coming in took, and it can adjust for it. So PTP has this built in on a short path or a long path. It's able to remove the path delay to get the right time count from the master into all of the slaves. I kind of like this one because it's a neat little analogy. This is a phase lock loop, but it involved, in this case, my granddad. And the way this worked was really quite simple. This is a carbon and metal based time locked loop. We're not transferring frequency in this example, we're transferring time. And this is exactly how a phase lock loop works. You have a running pendulum clock, and at noon you tune in the radio signal, and at the tone the time is noon, and you set your clock. You come back the next day, you tune in the radio time signal again. This is the message from the master, the PTP master says, oh, the time is now this. So you look at your clock and it's a little off. So you adjust your clock and you reach down, you adjust the rating nut on the pendulum to adjust your oscillator, right? That's your time base. You need to adjust that to the right frequency. So you reach down, you adjust that, you wait a day, get another sample, have a look at how far you're off, correct it perhaps, and adjust your oscillator. And eventually over time, this pendulum will swing at a rate that'll allow this to keep time for a very, very, very long period of time. But it's a phase lock loop using time. There's no frequency on the input side of this. And what it really looks like more generally in the pre-TP world is something like this. It's the same deal. In this case, the GPS is going to tell us the time. So we have a master running time count that we're going to stick into the network. And the slave is going to receive this time count, and it needs to somehow lock itself to it. What we want to ultimately do is take that master time base oscillator and transfer it to the local time base oscillator in the slave device. And remember, there's one master there's thousands potentially of slaves. So the way it works is the same. You get an incoming time value, you compare it to your local time, and you have an error. And that error reaches out and adjusts the rating nut on your local time base oscillator to change its frequency. The next sample comes in, you compare it again. You may be closer, you may be further, probably you're closer if you didn't go the wrong way, so you can adjust your oscillator a little more, a little more, until eventually every incoming time message is not errored in any way with respect to your locally kept time. Brilliant. You're now frequency locked. And that's how we use time transfer to convey frequency. And this is the key. If we can convey time across the IP network without concern for frequency, as long as we can get that time across in a precise manner, we can derive frequency that drove that upstream counter, that upstream clock, and have that same oscillator running in every slave device. But how do you align this to real time? I mean, this is all great. But what does it all mean? Well, we need to have some kind of an anchor. We need to know when something was midnight or something. And so PTP said, well, fine, here's what we're going to do. This counter one time had a value of zero. So we're going to say that occurred midnight, January 1st, 1970. And at that instant in time, we applied the clock and started counting nanoseconds. And it counts today, and it'll count for millennia if, if we want it to. So the beauty of this now is we can count seconds from 1970, January 1st, which means you can calculate the precise date and time anytime you want. So what do we do? Well, if we say that all of our signals had 
some event at that same instant in time, and if we know the periodicity of that signal, we can calculate that signal's periodicity and repetition for a very, very long time forward. And in fact, if the time base and the count are the same, locked together, the count is running from that time base, you can calculate for an infinite period of time where the signal will be with respect to the PTP count. So the slaves know these rules. The slaves can calculate the same event times. So the slaves then virtually know a signal that was epoch aligned at any given time, every slave in the network knows the phase of that signal. And that's how this is central to 2059. So in order to send sync pulses and signals using timestamps, SMPTE 2059 connects PTP to all of our SMPTE standards. And it does it this way. Inside SMPTE 2059, which I'm going to call here, here forward, I'm going to call SMPTE PTP. It's our own flavor of PTP. It specifies for every signal of interest, it specifies the alignment point. Where was that signal? January 1st, 1970. What was the phase of the signal? The formulas necessary to calculate the events in the signal. What are events in the signal? Events are things like vertical, horizontal, pixels. We can calculate the position of all of these from PTP. And the most important thing we can do is calculate when the next alignment point for a signal is coming. Because that's the point in time you want to make use of to synchronize phase. And these alignment points in this document are calculated and available for analog SD and HD. And you may say, well, why do I want analog SD? Hello, let's color black. It never went away. Composite television is still our primary video reference in the world. Can you believe it? Digital HD and SD, we can generate these signals directly without use of a genlock because we know their phase in 1970. So we now know their phase at any point in time today. We don't need an intermediate genlock. We can cut out the middleman. Also covered in the document is AES-3, just for completeness. It's not ours, but we thought, heck, we ought to align it anyway because we use it all the time. And of course, SD-12 timecode can be derived from 2059. So the alignment point then at the PTP epoch, January 1st, 1970, we establish what the phase of signals are. And then when you generate it with a precision time base, you can predict the next alignment point from the formula and the period in the standard, and so on, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Now, what about standards that are not invented today? They're not in this 2059 document. I mentioned earlier, what if we come up with 700 and some odd frames per second of some ridiculous frame shape or frame size or who knows what? How do we do this? Well, all we need to do is establish for that, it's a periodic thing, right? It's a, it's a frame rate based thing. If we specify what the alignment of it was at the epoch, we say, okay, we've invented this new standard. At the epoch, it was this part, you know, this point in time of this picture. We provide the formula for calculation of these events. We have formula for calculating the next alignment point. We can accommodate something we don't know today because we can arbitrarily define this stuff. So PTP actually gives us an infrastructure that allows us to do something in the future that we don't actually know about today because it is based on pure time and pure frequency and we can work from that because it's anchored in time, in real time. So what we've done in fact in the documents is we've said, you know what, we don't want to open up simply 2059 every time there's a new standard. So 2059 contains everything we know about to this point. Future standards will contain this stuff within themselves. And they'll point to 2059 and say, oh, use 2059, and by the way, for this new standard, this new format, these are the pieces you need that would be in 2059 if it was written today instead of some years ago. So it's virtual genlock. Slave devices now can synthesize reference signals using the rules of 2059. You send them PTP, they lock to it, and they can now synthesize these. They can make a real signal. They can make color black out of PTP, just in case you want to lock up something old-fashioned. Or we can simply internally generate these signals in a virtual way and provide this timing internally. Slave devices as well don't even need an intermediate concept of genlock. We can simply derive the signals timing directly from PTP and generate these signals without the need for any intermediate sense of something like a virtualized color black. Because 2059 contains the formula that says, oh, you want to make HD, SDI, Here's the parameters that you calculate from PTP to get to the pieces of the HDSDI signal directly. So we have this stuff now in hand. It's well handled, but what about the essence? And Lee hinted that SMPTE 2110 made good use of this, and turns out it was a pretty nice, uh, a nice synergy. 
PTP is the core timing infrastructure for SMPTE 2110. Specifically, SMPTE PTP, because our 2059 PTP has some things in it that are important to us. And I'm not going to go into detail on those. We can talk about those in another session perhaps sometime. Regular old PTP will work, but to build a truly rich media ecosystem, SMPTE PTP is fairly important. We distribute it throughout the system on all of the links that are carrying essence. We use these timestamps to achieve synchronization so we can generate genlocked signals, now in quotes. I, I don't know if genlock's the word we use in the future, I guess. It's a pretty good word. I kind of like it. Um, we can now align these independent streams to the receiver. As Lee pointed out, we're no longer transmitting a single stream that contains all of our stuff. We're transmitting a bunch of streams, each of which contain pieces of our stuff that we put together or use independently. So we need to align these things at a receiver. A receiver receives video from here and audio from there. Maybe it's even coming from the same source, but there's lots of reasons stuff can get delayed on its way from A to B. Coming in and out of a network switch, there's only one wire, you've got two packets, one's got to wait for the other at some point. So there's lots of reasons to realign streams. And we can use it to realign back to PTP, which is our house reference, it's our, it's our Genlock reference for our, our IP-based facility. So these clocks, these counters that we use in 2110 are derived from PTP. Now the frequency and resolutions of course differ. PTP is based on a gigahertz. We, we use weird frequencies and weird numbers, 5994. What well, could get weirder than that except perhaps drop frame? And so again, simply 2059 takes care of connecting gigahertz-based PTP to our funny frequencies and our funny phases. And in 2110, these are specifically clocks that are related to the essence. So for 2110-20 video and for 2110-40 ancillary metadata, uh, we're using 90 kilohertz as a standard clock. For those who are familiar with MPEG transport streams, you probably know 90 kilohertz fairly well. It's a video-friendly frequency. It's been around a long time. It's related to 27 megs. It maps nicely onto all sorts of video-centric things. So that's the fundamental frequency we're using as a timestamp clock for video. For audio, 48 kilohertz makes a great deal of sense. It's fundamental sample rate, beautiful. Now we can sample accurately tag, video, tag audio. Video is easy, by the way. A video frame is a big, long thing, and audio samples a little wee thing. And you need to align these things very correctly, especially if you have a lot of audio channels and you're trying to reproduce a sound field. You can't have any sample slip when you're Try to move a sound field around or the sound field will swim on you, right? And these are nice integer frequencies with respect to PTP. So jitter is not a problem getting to and from 48 kilohertz and the PTP clock. So 2110 devices then, inside the equipment, or now I should say inside the software, really actually not a lot of things change. Your vision mixer still does all the things it does on the inside, right? It's got all the same buses, all the same mixy bits, all that. Um, nothing really changes. What changes is the interfaces, right? The guts aren't changing, just the interfaces are changing. So their clock rates now become 2110 specific, and they're not video and audio interfaces. We get our reference now from PTP, not an analog reference. And the received streams are now independent and not necessarily time correlated. They're time related, but the correlation part is the function of the synchronization mechanisms we're using. So now the network transport becomes involved in our synchronization, and this is where it gets even weirder or cooler, depending on how you look at it. We have a protocol called real-time protocol. This is something that lives on top of UDP, which lives on top of IP, which lives on top of Ethernet on our network. And this has been around for some time. It's from the IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force. It's called RFC 3550. And this is already a widely deployed method to move audio and video over IP networks. It's used for streaming video. It's used for VoIP telephony. It, it's a very robust and well-debugged technology. And we mostly use this over UDP packets like we do in 2110. UDP packets, of course, are push packets. You push them out and you, say, you wave goodbye to them. If they get lost, you never know. If the receiver doesn't get them, you have no awareness. The whole idea is that you push them out and network engineering gets them there. This supports multicast, which is important, because what do we do in our systems? What do we do with routing switchers? We take one source and we send it to 9 or 10 or 50 or 100 outputs on the routing switcher. That's multicasting in quotes. We need a technology that can do that. RTP can do that has a very low overhead to the payload. As Lee pointed out, it's a very small percentage overhead. It accommodates things like out-of-order management, just in case you get into that. It's not very desirable, but it can happen. And it provides a precision timestamp capability. This is very important. It also has a handy little thing called a marker bit. 
which we can repurpose to identify something very important to us in video, which is vertical. And that's kind of a neat thing too, because when you can parse the header of a packet without going into the packet and say, ah, this packet represents vertical, that's very cool. You can do neat things with that. There's the packet header very quickly. This is straight out of the document. You can see the great big timestamp there, 32-bit timestamp. And you can see as well, there's a little M up near in the top row. That's our marker bit. That's our handy little vertical sync indicator. But this is right in the transport packet header. How do we use it? Well, we transport video with dash 20, and it's a constrained subset of RFC 4175, which is another Internet Engineering Task Force standard. And son of a gun, 4175 can use PTP. We transport only the pixels. As Lee mentioned, no need to send the blanking, no need to send the audio, no need to send EAV, SAV, and all that nonsense. All we want is the pixel map, the, 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 the pixel array, the raster, as we might have once called it. Audio, we're using dash 30. It's a constrained subset of AES 67. Why AES 67? Because it's done and because it works. And it works really well and it uses RTP. So we've constrained it ever so slightly and we've called that our SIMPTE 2110 audio format. Nothing wrong with not reinventing a wheel if you don't need to. And then the ancillary metadata is being transported according to a standard called Dash 40. And it normally, normatively references a new RFC uh, kicked off uh, by Tom Edwards from Fox. And do we have a number yet, Thomas? It's in the RFC publication queue. It's in the RFC public. Everything's in the publication queue this week. Anyway, this document simply references that IETF document. And it's the transport of ancillary metadata over IP, again using RTP. Again, there's our clock frequencies. You notice they're very friendly to PTP, and they're friendly to what we do. So what does the timestamp represent? Well, it's strictly related to the essence, right? In video, it means the sampling instant of the frame. And we don't normally think of that in television. You get a video frame, there's your frame. What was the sampling instant? Top left corner, bottom right, center of the picture. There's actually some discussion to be had around that, but the intent is that the timestamp represents the sampling instant. And all of the packets that have pixels from that frame have the same timestamp. And that timestamp corresponds to the 2059 alignment point for that signal. And we set the marker bit at the end just to let you know the frame is over and you can parse it quickly. For audio, the timestamp represents the sampling instant of the first sample in the packet. And each packet in this case has a new timestamp, whereas in video, every packet in a video frame shares the same timestamp of the alignment point for that frame until the next frame comes. Metadata is handled the same as video. So here's how it looks very quickly. A PTP slave locks the internal media clock in the device. This is the clock that's doing your video and audio processing. And from that, we can generate video and audio timestamps. If perchance, do I have this one here? I do. If perchance you don't have PTP, you can still do the same thing. In the case of having PTP, you lock your time base to PTP and you inform your timestamps from PTP. But if you don't have it, well, nothing is stopping you from running free. You can still generate timestamps that are related to each other from a single counter running off an internal time base that's not externally referenced. At the receiver, the receiver receives these multiple streams, a bunch of videos, a bunch of audios, ancillary metadata streams. If all their timestamps came from PTP, the receiver can correlate them to its local PTP and realign them by just managing the buffers that they live in. They can calculate which timestamps of one type align with another of which types of other streams, right? And you can manage all these buffers. If the transmitter happened to be free running, then you calculate the timestamps locally. And you can calculate based on the cadence of these two, in our case, 90 kilohertz to 48 kilohertz, you can figure out how they are related and how they should be aligned. So the transmitter calculates the alignment point at the media clock instant, makes an RTP clock, it starts emitting packets. If it's coming from SDI, it has to wait for blanking. Those pixels are way down below the alignment point. If it's coming from memory, frame buffer, you can start sending right away. We transmit the packets as soon as enough pixels are delivered to the transmitter interface, and we continue at a uniform rate, such that by the end of the frame, all the pixels of that frame are transmitted. A little different from what we do today, because we can now use the entire video time to transmit just the raster. The receiver gets the packets, and it starts filling up a receiver buffer. And it comes at, the packets are coming, of course, at a uniform rate, but they're now jittered. They've been across the network. There's been queuing delays. People have had to wait for traffic lights in the network. So when there's enough pixels in hand, the receiver buffer starts getting emptied out at a uniform rate. And over time, the transmit and receive rates are the same when the jitter is averaged out. So after a vertical comes by, the packets now contain pixels from a new frame. 
They have a new timestamp, and that timestamp conveys their alignment to the reference. Let's talk quickly about latency. Um, we need some buffering, right? We, there's transmitter jitter, for example, in a software device where there's a lot of processes going on and you're trying to deliver uniformly paced packets. It's pretty tough. Sometimes you've got to wait a little. Sometimes you've got to send one a little early. There's lots of queuing in the network. There's lots of buffers between here and there. And there's queuing in the link. You have 10 things going out on a single hose. You actually have to make a bunch of them wait while one's on the wire and the next one and so on. So the receiver has to have enough buffer that we can handle any burst or any gap and we have a profile, we have a timing profile, as Lee mentioned, called Dash 21, which helps accommodate and deal with the fact that you can never under or overflow, right? It's a continuous stream of essence. So we have these transmission profiles that are in Dash 21, and that's a whole subject for another day. Quick note on our latencies today, and I'm seeing the clock. Does anybody want to have their break? If you want to have your break, I'll be about another minute. But I got six seconds. We're used to very small latencies, right? How long, is, how long is latency in coax? Eight inches per nanosecond, right? Something like that? It's very hard to build up any amount of significant delay in a piece of coax. Even in reclockers for SDI, uh, even you know, deserializing, reserializing is extremely small latency. So equipment also has extremely huge timing buffers by comparison, right? For a couple of decades now, vision mixers have had two, three, four line auto timing windows makes it easy to time, gives you system building flexibility. You can route a signal to a short distance studio, a far distance studio. They fall within the timing buffers in both cases. It's really good. And these latencies are extremely small operationally. Quick one here at 10 gigs, dash 20 packets around a microsecond. The packet itself is huge latency compared to everything we've ever done before. But here's the question. Is it really operationally significant? And I think the answer is probably no. What is live? Live is changing. When you watch live TV at home, it's deferred by seconds across your distribution path. So what really is live? 2110 has much higher latency, but it's irrelevant to the reality of what we need to get done. PTP on a Genlock connector, that's a whole other topic for another day. I won't even go deep here because I've talked too much already and I'm getting the evil eye. I can feel it. We can build hybrid systems, and I'll leave it on this slide because this is the best part of it all. Because we can do legacy signals and we can do 2110 signals with the same PTP, and the same SMPTP PTP 2059, you can now mix and match them in a hybrid system. And this is the key to evolving from where we are today to the future. You can build a 2110 plant with SDI in it. You can build an SDI plant like you have today at a 2110 facility. The cloud, that's a whole other topic for another day. And be careful, PTP is not black burst. This stuff is not straightforward in the same kind of way. So in summary, we use RTP timestamps to align this stuff up. We get the timestamps for 2059. Receivers use the RTP timestamps to bring the streams together in time, and then we can use PTP to align them back to house. And of course, we deal with time code as well. Thank you very much. Enjoy your break. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.